Hello to you friends, this is Dhamma on air number 6, recorded in the beginning of 2016, so Happy New Year to you. There are seven questions today, but first the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Worthy Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened is the best Buddha. A very fullständig complete or perfect selfless at mercy of Buddha. The first question is there are 31 levels of existence in this universe according to the Buddhist teachings. Are there other universes as well? Is there such such thing as a multiverse? Yes, there is. Uh, from for many reasons, and also for the Buddha, he, the Buddha was asked, "Are there more than one uh, universe, or what corresponds to a universe in our language?" And then he said that there was an infinite number of universes with uh, other uh, other world systems. He called them that uh, contains their Buddhas and their deities. Uh, so uh, he called this world system uh, a Chakavala. Uh, Chakavala means wheel, world wheel. And uh, a wheel is a round thing with something in the middle. And it seems very likely that what the, the correct translation of Chakavala, world wheel, is galaxy. But it's not entirely sure that this is so. Uh, but it seems so. And this means that there, in each galaxy is a, a system with a Buddhas appearing there in this particular galaxy and a corresponding set of 31 levels of existence in that particular galaxy. Then there's a, on the broad sense, there can be many galaxies. Uh, there's approximately uh, at least. 100 billion in our universe now, uh, but uh, it's probably and this 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 universe is what the Buddha he he spoke about already 2,500 years ago. Something that is dynamic, so the universe expands and then it contracts, and expands and contracts, and so from a big bang there comes a large expansion. He says, and then it holds still for a time, then it starts to contract again, and then there's a big crunch. This big crunch is, is, is followed by uh, something you could call nuclear fire, where there's, everything is burned up, but not uh, on, on all the levels of the 31 levels of existence. So some beings survive beyond uh, the universe, and it's, so it can be seen as it comes out of, in outer space, uh, outside, or on another level of time, there can be existence staying there at the Brahma level. So they are not, they are not uh, affected by the big crunch. And it, this gives some interesting uh, correlates to some parts of modern cosmology that says, uh, due to the observer effect of quantum mechanics, that there has to be observers in the universe, in a new universe to appear. And then uh, people say, ah, but after the Big Bang, there's no beings. Um, that's not true, according to Buddhism. There's many beings after a big crunch, or oh, a big, uh, a big crunch, yes, uh, and before the Big Bang, there is beings. So there is observers that can puff the squiff, uh, so to speak, of the quantum mechanical wave function and make things, material things, appear. So the anthropocentric uh, model of cosmology in modern cosmology, which is a quite, you can say, esoteric uh, theory, this seems to be uh, confirmable from Buddhist theory. So you can, if you envision uh, the multiverse as a very big sponge, so uh, while uh, one one universe over here is is contracting, another universe here is expanding, and this happens all over the place. So it's kind of like a sponge. There's contraction here and expansions there. This has a very neat feature that we, if we take the whole system, then there will be conservation of mass. There will be conservation of space, 
and there will be conservation of energy, and there will be conservation of information. And this is very, very neat. So this branch model of the multiverse uh, seems, I think, more than likely, actually. So the Buddha says, yes, there's more than one world system, more than one world universe. Uh, and yes, there's beings when this has happened a big crunch. And so, so that can be confirmed from, from, from what he said about this. I hope this answer about the, the universe. Then there are another question related to that, beings in the universe. And this is question two. Uh, who are the four guardian gods or devas? Uh, and what do they guard? Uh, we are now, there's 31 levels of, of conscious existence, and we are now on level four. Uh, sh sorry, on level five. And on level six, the next level, there's this Katu Maharajika. Chatu four Maha Big Rajika kings, the four great kings. And what do they got? They, they, they got the four corners. See? They, so they are on level, uh, on level six, one level up. They are still in Kamaloka, so they, they still have a uh, sense desire. Uh, they are home to four different kings, which has their own uh, function and retinue. Uh, Dharatta, uh, Dacharatra of the east, Virulhaka of the south, Virupaka of the west, and Vesarana of the north. And they have a large follow, large follow for beings there. Uh, the Gandapas, which are the divine uh, musicians, the Kumbandas, the Nagas, and the Yakas. And not all of these are good guys, but in general you can say uh, they protect the Buddhas and as they also protect Buddhists. Uh, and they, this is their job. They are kind of like mercenaries on their, uh, on their level. They are hired by their lords, which is one level up again, which is on level seven, uh, the Tavatimsa, the, the level where there's 33 devas uh, living there that has a kind of like, like a large assembly. And they have these guys as guards, and they fulfill many functions as also musicians. Uh, they 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 have to be reporters or recorders uh, to this uh, for king uh, for for uh, the Tavahimsa level, where they are living one level below. So they come down. They send their sons down here every two weeks. They send their uh, counselors and ministers down here every two weeks to see what we humans are doing. And they also come themselves uh, once in a while. And then they go and report whenever there's a meeting at uh, the Tavahimsa level. They have to, their function is to come and report what's happening on planet Earth. What are the humans doing? So they are recorders and reporters. Then they are also uh, guarding uh, the lower levels against attack from below. There's also wars up there. Uh, from the Asuras, the demons that wants to uh, defeat which are envious at the privileges of the Tavahimsa heavens uh, inhabitants, so they want to attack them to, to gain hold of the uh, privileges. Among those, a, st a strange kind of liquor uh, that is come from a, from a fruit that gives you an intoxication which lasts something in the round of half a year. There's many other things they are fighting about, but this is just to mention some of it. A lot of people here don't fight about money and territory and fame and name and so on. They fight also about the same, more or less the same thing. Among them also uh, something that could, could be called uh, divine alcohol. So they are not kind of like, uh, they are in the same boat as others, as, as we are, and they are guided by the same thing as in humans are and all beings in karma loka are by sense desire they want to sense something and this gives them pleasure so they are fighting about what they can get of pleasure from this sensing they uh, so in in general they they are good guys but you cannot say they are all uh, good guys they they live by a human computation 90,000 years but then one has to think uh, again that the, the time, because of uh, 
Einsteinian relativistic theory, it goes four times slower at their level. So this means that they have a, a, a real time in our time perception. Uh, which if we should compare, then they have a life length of 22,000 years. But that's also 22,500 years, to be exact. That's also fairly long. Why is time going slower at that level? Yes, uh, uh, it seems that they, uh, uh, there can be time zones. You know, Einstein and relativity, if we take that first, if you have an observer here and there's something moving in front of him, then if whatever he observes in that ref reference frame that is moving relative to him, their time will go slower. Time is dilated, but length in that reference frame is has become shorter, and that length, that time dilation and length contraction uh, increases as a, as the speed of the moving reference frames approaches the speed of light, where actually the length collapses completely, and uh, the time is on a on a turning point to start to go backwards. If there was anything that was going with the speed faster than light, then the time frame in that observable time in that reference frame will go backwards. For example, if it was a train, then the train, the length of the train will collapse in the, in the direction it was moving uh, to zero, but not in the, if you look at it from exactly from the front. And if you could get a time signal from it, uh, then it, it seems that time was standing still at the speed of light. This is the first nail this is special relativity from 1905 by Albert Einstein, repeatedly experimentally confirmed. This is the first nail in the naive realist uh, conception of what reality is. Because the naive realist, you say that uh, there is an absolute time. It goes with the same speed wherever in the universe. And it's the same for whatever observer. And it doesn't depend on whether the observer is moving or not. That's not true. That's not true. That's just not true. And the same he says for, for space, it's a space is the same wherever. It doesn't contract, it doesn't uh, dilate, it cannot do anything like that. Space, the length is the same, the one meter is the same wherever you take it. And it doesn't depend on the observer, whether the observer is moving or not. One meter is one meter. No, it's not so, it's not so. This one has to dig a little bit. Special relativity is a fact. So the naive reality, bye-bye, <whistles> doesn't work, doesn't work. Time and space are not absolute. They are relative to the observer. Buddha says so also. This, I think, was enough about time and space and the four uh, great kings. But uh, just to say, continue where they live, uh, their reference frame is moving according to our reference frame. The Buddha doesn't say, but uh, the way I think it is, is a so-called time, sp space-time onion, where you have a, a layered structure where there's ro rotating time, space-time frames within each other. And this means that you have, if you have a kind of like a layer, like in an onion, that is rotating around a core, then the space-time in the layer, outer layer, will go slower than if you are if you are observing from inside the core. And the same if there's another layer outside that layer and another layer outside that layer, like in an onion. And then these layers are moving, uh, rotating around each other with the same center of mass, in this case, planet Earth. And that's uh, where I think it should be seen. Because if you travel out, uh, time will go slower and slower and slower and slower uh, in that reference frame. So, uh, and when you come back, you, there will be no, there will be no difference. You, you cannot see it uh, or feel it or perceive it. But uh, there will be a time difference still. And that's because of uh, this movement of the reference frames. So much for uh, question two, who are the four guardian gods? They serve these functions. They guard the directions. They serve as heavenly musicians 
They serve as reporters and recorders, and they serve as a kind of mercenaries for the Tawahimsa Himmel for one day. They're kind of like waiters, you can say, on a higher level. The question three is, is an individual uh, or person called Mara, king of death, or is it the sinful thoughts of human minds, so-called stinking thinking? Actually, it is in a very neat and subtle way, both. Uh, because Mara is a, uh, a real individuality, no, no matter about it. He lives at the, the Devas wielding power over others, creations. That is the Parinimita Vasavati Devas. They, uh, they have this funny feature that they don't get a kick if they perceive something. They, they have to get. They can only get perceived pleasure if somebody else is doing something. So they are. We are a part of their computer game, you can say. We are a part of their gaming experience. So they only uh, get a kick if, for example, regarding sex. They don't have any pleasure if they they make sex themselves. They have to see others make sex or make others make sex. And since they live very, very long time, then they they tend to make some kind of like kinky sex. All at that level, Mara is a, regarded as a rapper, as a terrorist at this level. So they can go into various people's minds and both in individual case and in uh, as a whole society, for example, the whole planet Earth or a whole village or a whole country and induce certain kind of thoughts in them. And they do that all the time. If you're not aware of it, they can, uh, Mara can walk in and walk out of your mind without you noticing like an open door. He is a, he has one particular political idea that sense pleasure is the highest pleasure. And he wants to invoke that on the word. And whoever uh, goes against that, this uh, he feels as a threat to his authority, to his ability to uh, push around these uh, inhabitants which he thinks he's wielding his power over, which also he is, actually, to various degrees. He, he doesn't wield any power over those who step out of it, who can control themselves. But those who cannot control themselves, if he induces any kind of thought in them, then they will act upon it, as it, it were their own thoughts. The way to recognize whether one is under influence of this Mara, this being, who is a frightening because he is exceedingly intelligent, but at the same time he is uh, probably the largest psychopath in the universe. If one comes into his presence and one knows about it, then within two or three meters, it feels like you are your bone marrow is. Uh, has been dipped in, in, in fluid, fluid uh, nitrogen and is, is frozen down instantly. It is truly a chilling experience. And you have to hold your horse that you don't pee your pants from fear, even knowing who he is. So frightened are you. However, uh, still one can hold the horse uh, and then it's just like any other being they can attack you and they can kill you and so on but that also goes for other beings than Mara he makes all kinds of tricks there's multiple reports of monks being afraid for example he, he made a artificial uh, earthquake for a monk who sat meditating inside his heart so his heart started dancing on the ground and then the, the monk uh, became very frightened and ran out his hut and out the forest and back to the monastery and asked the Buddha what was, what was happening and say, the Buddha said, calm down, go back to your hut, meditate, it's Mara pulling your leg. And if you don't act on it, then there will be no dancing of your hut. And this monk did. There's also several other cases. He tries to, uh, he, he tries to seduce uh, a nun but she says, there's, there's nothing here that you can seduce. There's no person here. There's no individuality here you can seduce. So he's kind of like puffed up. 
there's many also recorded of many uh, conversations between Mara, which is in the Christian terminology called Satan, and the evil one. Uh, he's also called Namuchi. Uh, Namuchi means the one you cannot escape. Nobody gets out of his, his grip, except by following the noble eightfold path. The nobles do get out of his grip. But the rest, they kind of like follow sway, because they cannot, they cannot stop uh, acting upon their own thoughts. which is not actually only their own, but which is uh, another individualist's thought and his deliberate induction because of his power, his degrees of freedom. Again, remember that consciousness is non-local and they are overlapping in any point of space. That means he can affect directly uh, other consciousness than his own consciousness. And this it does. In order to answer more specifically, Buddha was asked this, I can just say that we, we say is there's several kinds of Mara. Mara means death. It means the evil one. It means the tempter. Uh, there's five kinds of Mara. There's Kanta Mara. It's made of all things that's put together. There's Kilesa Mara. It's the mental defilements. There's also Mara. There's uh, Deva Putta Mara and Apisankara Mara. Apisankara Mara means everything that is put together out in the world. And Deva Putta Mara is, means this some a person who has a, 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 a real personality at one of these 31 levels of existence. So he said the highest level you can be at still be in Karma Loka. He's not in the Brahma Loka, still in the Karma Loka. Uh, but much higher than human. To just to give you an, an idea, uh, a monk once asked exactly these questions, uh, and I and I will uh, read out what the Buddha he said. Venerable sir, they say, Mara Mara. What is Mara, the evil one? Then the Buddha said, Rata. This was a monk who asked. Rata, form, feeling, perception, mental construction, and consciousness is Mara. It's a state of Mara. It's impermanent. It's of an impermanent nature. It's suffering. It's of a painful nature. It's no self. It's of an impersonal nature. It's in a state of destruction. It's in a state of vanishing. It's in an unstable state. It's always in a state of momentary ceasing vanishing right there and then. Rara, you should therefore eliminate any desire, any lust, and any attraction. You should leave behind all desire and lust for whatever is a state of Mara, for whatever is impermanent, for whatever is only impermanent appearance, for whatever is suffering, for whatever is of a perfect, painful nature, for whatever is no self, for whatever is of an ownerless nature, for whatever is a state of destruction, for whatever is in a state of vanishing, for whatever is in a state of arising, and for whatever that is in a state of a cessation. And that rather is in a state of cessation. What is it? Form is in a state of cessation. Feeling, perception, mental constructions, and consciousness is also in a state of continuous ceasing cessation, ending, vanishing. Understanding this Rata, the well-instructed noble disciple experiences disgust towards form, disgust towards feeling, disgust towards perception, disgust nibida towards mental construction, and disgust towards consciousness itself. Experiencing this disgust, he becomes disillusioned, virada, through this dissolution, his mind is released, he's detached, his clinging is, is stopped. When his mind is released, he instantly knows this mind is liberated, and he understands. Eliminated is rebirth, this noble life is all completed, done is what should be done, 
There's no state of being beyond this one. So there one can see that the Buddha, he identifies Mara not only as the individuality of a, the evil one, like the devil, he also identifies it correctly with the influence he has over this particular monk, Radha. That he influences thinking in a sensual way to think that either his body or his feelings uh, or his mental constructions or his perceptions or his consciousness is his own and can make him wander around in the world and experience pleasure forever and he can keep it. This this influence he, you, one has to pull out and see things as they are, that they are impermanent, that they are no self, that they are a form of suffering, ultimately speaking. And it's right there seeing this, knowing this, that one stops being attached to this reality, this appearance and disappearance. Because this reality is not static, it's a process, it's a dynamic thing. It comes and it goes. In any moment, there's rebirth of one's own body and one's own mind, and similarly with the world. So it's very, very ephemeral, very, very vanishing, very, very unreal, very, very blinking, very, very fast. So nothing, nothing, nothing is the same from one moment to the next moment. Thereby nothing, nothing, nothing can ever be kept. Thereby is nothing, nothing, nothing ever attractive in the real sense, because it cannot be, it cannot be a lasting source to happiness. It cannot be because of this impermanence. So, uh, when you ask, "Is Mara is a real individual individuality? Is it is it like a person?" Yes, and truly frightening he is. And he is probably in your mind right now. One way of identify is that if you recognize thoughts in your own mind, this thinking, thinking, that is particularly weird, that is particularly horny, that is particularly uh, perverse, that is particularly uh, tempting, that is particularly pushing you around, wants you to do something, and you kind of like, so who, what, what's that, what's going on? then you, you can kind of like say, ah, this is not your thoughts. It's somebody else's thoughts. It's somebody else who wants to push you out over the edge to do something because he wants to get pleasure from seeing you doing it. There's also plenty of, other, of beings at his level. They don't want people to do, or beings to do something evil. And it's not only on the human level, it's also on the higher level. For example, the two other levels I just mentioned to you, level six and level seven, uh, the four great kings and the 33 gods, they are also under Mara's influence. Same as here, same as here. And that's why the Buddha, he called him the most powerful. He cannot go higher than, he cannot go the, uh, among the Brahmas, for example. Uh, he can go, but they, they don't, uh, it's not under influence of his consciousness because their consciousness is in, in, in a permanent state of from the first jhana and above. This means that you cannot ch change the object of the mind. But Mara, on the lower level, you can change the object of the mind by pushing it around. For example, uh, making, uh, inserting a, a pornographic image. If you do that in the cinema, for example, uh, this one was done in the old days, where one inserted uh, pictures, only one frame of a Coca-Cola, a cold Coca-Cola with water running down of it of the bottle. And then everybody com coming out of the cinema, they want a Coca-Cola. And they go to the bar and buy a Coca-Cola. This is not, this hidden advertisement is not allowed anymore. But Amara doesn't care about that. He can still insert one frame of consciousness, one Dharma state, in your mind without you knowing it. Still this is effective. Still this, for example, if it's a pornographic image, then you feel will feel an urge for sex. If it's a, a food image, you will feel an urge for food without knowing, because it's on the subconscious level. Only one frame out of fifty, you don't you don't see it. 
you don't notice it, but still it affects the mind because the mind reacts on it. So it's a subconscious, but still intentionally effective influence. One example I can give from the text, uh, the Buddha was in the middle of his career wondering about uh, he should then uh, get arms food. He was came, coming uh, barefooted with his arms ball into a village. And then uh, Mara, he descended and uh, his thought and influence and also descended with his physical body and made all people in this village think that the Buddha was a pedophile, that he had sex with children. And therefore, when the Buddha went round from door to door, he didn't get anything. He didn't get anything. And so, Mara, he was standing, leaning, uh, like this, uh, on, the, on the gate, at the, at the village, at the other end of the village, where the Buddha should pass out. And then he asked, Ah, uh, Gautama, did you, get a, did, did you give any, did you get anything? And then the Buddha, he saw immediately, recognized, even though he, you know, these guys here could take up any form they like, any color they like. And he, he just looked like a, a regular 18, 19 year old a man dressed in clothes from that particular village. And so he, but he, immediately he recognized Mara as this artist is Mara. And said, no, Mara, I didn't get anything. And it was because of you. And you know that. Uh, and then Mara said to him, ah, but if you didn't get anything, why don't you go back and then try once more? Then you maybe get it something, huh? get some food. But then would said, no, you will do it even worse. They will hit me with sticks if I go back. And that was exactly. So there you see the Buddha, he was on a high level. He could read the intention of Mara. But Mara could not read the mind of the Gautama Buddha thereby see whether he would go back or not. So he has to try to persuade him, to push him back into the village, to beg one more and then be beaten up with a stick. So this is, so he has this ability, like all other Paranimitta, Vasavati, Deva, they have powers over the mental construction, the verbal construction, what you say, mental construction, what you think. The verbal construction, what you say, including to what you say to yourself, and the physical construction, what you do with your body, over other beings, they can intentionally change that and do that, and that's their, uh, that's their, as I say, gaming experience is the closest I can come to our level. We can have a gaming experience with a social game, computer game where you are directing an army to go there and go there, or you are directing a, a, a group of individuals to build a city here and not there, and build this and that city and so on and so on. So you can, uh, with, your, with your powers, you can, uh, on this gaming virtual rea form of reality, you can get various kinds of individuals to, to act in various kinds of ways. Same thing with them. Same thing with them. Because they are acting uh, through uh, through the mind, through the consciousness, and through intention, then uh, it gives birth to uh, the, it, it. It it makes sense then to say that they, there is also a kilesa mara because this is his influence. This is mental defilements, lost aversion. He can make as I just thought of, he can make somebody else's hate something, uh, hate even a Buddha, because he has inserted a lie that he's a pedophile in their mind. So he inserted a mental construction, then their aversion flames up. So he is actually both. He's both. He's an individuality, and he's also uh, identified as a mental influence, and the result hereof, the mental defilement, of human beings and other beings as well, on much higher level than humans. If I should say some individuality or personality uh, here on the human level that reminds me most of his uh, personality, 
uh, just in a much much uh, weaker in a much much weaker state then it is um, this the evil guy in 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 Batman this guy who has this smile painted on his face Batman's opponent his the Joker huh? his is similar in personality very intelligent very tricky very fast twitching like nothing but also exceedingly psychopathic exceedingly evil unpredictable a psychopath in 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 the, in the truest sense of that word and frightening 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 There's only one way to break out of his influence. That's to gain control over your own thoughts. Because then you're, you're cutting his control. That's the only way. Un until that has happened, you are uh, in your own will to some extent, and then you are a robot to some other extent, without knowing it. Without knowing it. And that's a tragic part. I think that goes for Mara. I have uh, several What is Mara uh, on my website. You go there and, and search for it. Then uh, you'll find about it. Uh, find more information about it if you like it. But it's a good question. Thank you for that. Then there is this uh, question four. The continuity of Dukkha suffering relies on karma. Does that mean that we have to clear away all of our karma negative and positive before we attain Nibbana. Yes, it does, actually. There's two kinds of Nibbana. Uh, there's also a a, a a drop of the of Dhamma on my website called the two Nibbanas. So it's nice Nibbana without trace and Nibbana with trace. We left remain. In, in Pali, Nibbana sa upatisesa with remnants of clinging left and then there's Nibbana and Upadisesa with no remnants no traces left traces of what you can say in our language traces of probability left because Kama is probability that is planted in, in all points of space as standing waves probability for certain events to happen and for certain events not to happen this is basically what probability is. For example, probability to have a body, a new body, at the moment, just after the moment of death. That is rebirth or transmigration. So this probability has to go in zero. This means that there will be no, no probability left for anything to happen for that particular stream of individual consciousness. Not only, not, uh, even not that this consciousness is regenerated, so, uh, what happens when uh, a person gets enlightened here, before he's dying, or before she is dying, is sa upatisesa, because this uh, individuality still has a body. So there's some, some remnant of a prior clinging, not at the moment of enlightenment. After that, there's no clinging. And if they become enlightened, uh, if they die here, then in the intervening period, they are exhausting the probabilities that they were created uh, before here, before here, before they became enlightened. So they became enlightened here. Then there's some traces left. Then they exhaust this or use up these traces until they die. And then they go into Nibbana and Upatisesa. There you have no body. You have no consciousness. You have no perception. The five khandas are, are terminated there. And they, they are not reoccurring as they are now because there's no probabilities there for them to reoccur. This also goes in quantum mechanics. If the amplitude, uh, which is the square of the probability, goes into zero, then you cannot make this observation. The, 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 the particle or the phenomena or the measurement or whatever that you, you can observe cannot be observed anymore because there's zero probability. 
and so it, it, it goes an arahat that has become awakened an awakened being is from the moment they are enlightened and until they die not forming any intentional karma they walk around but they have no preferences they have no intentions for this or that they have no intentions to be free of this or that they have no preferences no biases whatsoever because of that they are exceedingly happy and they're not afraid of this this moment that where they will die because they know this is the ultimate uh, kind of climax on their entire samsaric uh, career and it's only there they become really free of suffering because an arahat from the moment they are, are enlightened until they die if they break a needle in their leg they, they still feel pain but they, they, they don't suffer from feeling pain but they still feel physical pain if they don't get anything to eat, they still uh, have hunger, but they don't uh, act out the hunger if they don't get, get any food. If they can't get food, they will go and get uh, some food in a blameless way. Uh, and then uh, get this physical yearning of the body to go down. But that's of course, they, 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 they still know, ah, this, I have to continue that until I die. And it's a pain in the ass. You have to and do the same thing, take this body out of bed today, every day, wash it, brush teeth on it, feed it, uh, free it from excrement, and so on, so forth. And still it will be sick and die. So the Arad, he wants to go somewhere else where there's no body. So he doesn't have to do this foolish, monotonic, uh, repeated actions you have to do to maintain a body. Be that, why is that? Because he knows that form, any form, this form, the body, and that form, the world, is suffering and nothing else than suffering and that nothing else than suffering arise and cease in this world so there's no reason to stay to hang around here so yes the answer is yes karma has to cease karma has to end there has to be an end of karma and that is basically that is exhausted after f there's no form of intentional actions uh, and then the the echoes of the f the former intentional actions they have been exhausted or used up, uh, and then the karmic accumulation goes into zero. And then enlightenment, nibbana, and upatisesa, without traces of clinging remaining, occurs. Uh, there's a particular event uh, that I can speak about which is kind of like demonstrated in a very nice way uh, this is said is in particular about those who as I do myself uh, practice Anapanasadi breathing meditation that they will know the exact moment of their death and this particular monk was here in here, Sri Lanka and is for some uh, probably in the early 4th or uh, between the 1st and the 4th century uh, B.C. no A.C. sorry A.C. after Christ uh, he was walking up and down and then he went to uh, to recite on the full moon night to recite the disciplinary rules 227 rules together with the other monks then after they had recited he went back to his kuti in the fellowship of the younger monks and then he came to his kuti where it was in the forest was a small aranya and then he said to the monks, ah, how many have you seen attain uh, Nibbana and Upadisesa? Paranibbana, go into Nibbana. In what posture have you seen it? Have you seen somebody sitting? Yes, they say, somebody has seen some sitting, sitting up and down uh, along a pole. Somebody, have you lying down? Yes, somebody else has seen lying down, sick people attain uh, Nibbana while lying down. Uh, but have anybody seen some monk attained Nibbana while walking. And then they say, no, whenever so nobody here has seen uh, another monk attain Nibbana while walking. Very well, friends, you say. I'll demonstrate for you. You see that stone down there at the end of the walking path? Yes, whenever so we see that stone down at the end of the walking path. Uh, I will now go down to that stone and then I will cross a line here, and then he took a stick, and then he <coughs> made a line in the sand. When my foot, the toe on my right foot, crosses this line, then I will attain 
para ni Bana an upati sesa. And then he slowly walked down there, returned around the stone, and came back. And when he moved his right foot and his big toe just crossed the line, touched the line, then he dropped down dead right there. And he, so this means that his karmic accumulation, uh, which he was aware of, and which he has acute time measurement on, so it's acute that he could say that when his toe was crossing or touching a, th a certain line, then exact, that exact moment it would happen. So th there his karmic accumulation goes into pure zero. Right there. This is something special, uh, particular to those who do breathing meditation, Anapanasati meditation, that they will know that. Not only when they are becoming in the internal nibbana, that is, they become enlightened, but also in other lives where they do not attain any state of nobility. They will still know the death moment with exact certainty if developed to a sufficient degree. So that was about the coming accumulation. Just think of it as a standing wave. The amplitude of the standing wave is the degree of the probability. And so this means that this wave can be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's an expression for all the echoes that you have sent out by doing things intentionally since the beginning of time which has not been exhausted yet. It's like standing waves. Echoes that keeps going back and forth. Buddha talks about the highest form of giving to adorn and decorate the mind. In what sense are we to adorn and decorate, decorate the mind? Like putting on jewelries and so on. And the highest form of giving is uh, giving that you do with the intention of becoming enlightened. So there can be, when one does a giving, one can form, many say, ah, this is for this and that, this is for this and that purpose, this is for getting a driver license, and this is for my mother and father, so they don't become hungry ghosts, uh, this is for not becoming sick, or whatever. But the, the highest form of giving, the Buddha say, is this specific, with the intention of becoming enlightened. And this is a decoration of them. Because this is an exceedingly subtle, fine, uh, ultimately refined, unsurpassable intention. That intention to become enlightened, to awaken. All beings will do it, but of course not before they intend it. And even if you intend it, it takes a, a fair amount of time to go there because of mental defilement, distractions, and so on. So this is the highest decoration of the mind, the highest adornment of the individual. It is not visible outside. You cannot see it on the body like a, ju a jewelry or a golden ring or a diamond or something like that. But it's much more, uh, much more worth than if you decorate the body with uh, a multitude of uh, thousand carat diamonds, for example, and platinum and whatever you have of external decorations. They are useless, all of them, at the moment of death. Because you cannot bring all this jewelry with you to the other side. Not at all. But the intention to become enlightened and having given with that intention, you can bring to the other side. Standing way, probabilities, they don't respect death. These probabilities are everywhere present and is effective thereby in every time, space, location where they are present. Then there's a question six. Uh, what is the Buddhist view on astrology, horoscopes, wearing of talismans, various rituals to uh, avoid bad or evil influences of the planets on a person's life? And this, uh, I'll just read aloud some, uh, because this is given in the Dikha Nikaya number two, the large sutta called the Dikha Nikaya number two, which is wrong livelihood for a monk or recluse, according to the Buddha, and which, uh, <laughs> He speaks about all the various forms of wrong livelihood. So if you see a monk or a recluse, or what should be supposed to be a holy man, perform any of these activities, then you can unambiguously conclude 
that this is a phony guy that knows nothing about nothing. And you can just leave him, turn around on your heel and leave him right there on the spot and never look back. Because so is it. I just find it again here, Dike Nikaya number two. Uh, while we're speaking, there was another question. Uh, and this is, what is mind? And is mind starting at the uh, time of the universe? Uh, and how long time does it start? Uh, how long time does it last? Yes, mind is a cyclic, uh, very quite uh, quickly going around cyclic process of uh, first contact one, where you have con sense contact either through the eye, the ear, the nose, uh, the mouth, or the skin as a touch, or the mind. And then feeling and perception one arise. And then from this feeling and this perception one, Perception one will say, ah, it's a cup, or it's a football. Uh, feeling one will say, it's pleasant or it's unpleasant. And from these two, football, pleasant, then there arises a sensation, I want, or I don't want. And this is the intention one. Uh, and from intention one, uh, uh, intention one. From intention one, attention one uh, occurs. So attention one is then redirected according to this intention. Do you want the football? Or do you want something else? So thereby, because of attention is redirected towards the object, a new object, then contact two, since contact two arise, then feeling two and perception two follows, and intention two, and a new attention two, where mind is redirected towards something else, or maybe the same object again arise. So this contact, feeling, perception, intention, attention. Contact, feeling, perception, intention, attention. Cycle. This is mind. And this arises and ceases exceedingly fast. Billions of times per second. When this start, uh, Buddha doesn't say, actually he says that no, pers there's no discernible beginning uh, of, of, of beings. And neither is there of time and space. Uh, this cyclic sequence of the single universe can be seen, but where this process before that is there any first universe, universal process? Nobody knows, and it's a, a, a question that cannot be asked. So one shouldn't uh, sh shouldn't do it. So and also this goes also same for the for the being. Uh, you can say the end is done, and you can also say what started the process. That's uh, basically ignorance. Uh, of the Four Noble Truths that has started the process of all the beings. But uh, when that happened, you cannot say. So mind is a momentary event, like also external reality. It's a momentary event. It's a blinking thing that comes into existence and sees again, comes into existence and sees again. And it goes around in a cycle, cycle sequence. Just like the same thing happening in the computer, actually. Uh, to go back to uh, the the uh, the question about uh, what the Buddha meant about horoscopes and so on, uh, I will read aloud this great section on virtue and wrong livelihood for for recluses and for monks. And it goes like this, whereas some contemplative and uh, priests, they living of food given in faith, maintain themselves by wrong livelihoods, such as animal arts, he called it animal arts, laying honoscopes, palmistry, reading marks in the palms, and all kinds of, uh, these kinds of trickery, selling stones which has some kind of mystical power, or talismans, or all this he called animal art. Animal art, it's a very good expression. But nevertheless, he called animals as such as reading marks on limbs, palmistry, reading omens and signs, in a, interpreting celestial uh, events, falling stars, comments, interpreting dreams, reading features of the body, phrenology, for example, reading in the tongue, reading marks on the cloth gnawed by mouse, 
uh, offering fire oblations, oblation from a ladle, oblation from husk, rice powder, rice grain. Oblation means that you can eat something, and then you, be, you your your mind is, uh, or you become pure from from eating something, and that is uh, basically bullshit. You cannot uh, become pure from uh, mentally pure from eating something or from taking a bath in a river, which is also or uh, t- putting on a fire or whatever or a funny hat. It doesn't work like that. M- mind is. Uh, a little more dirty, actually, a little more ignorant, a little more superstitious after one has repeated these ineffective uh, actions. So again, uh, making predictions based on the fingertips, geomancy, making predictions for state officials, laying demons in the cemetery, placing spells on spirits, uh, divining water or divining diamonds, snake skills, poison skills, uh, scorpion skills, rat skills, bird skills, crow skills, predicting lifespans, giving protective charms, uh, casting horoscopes. He lives, he abstains, one who is a real monk, he abstains from wrong livelihoods such as these animal arts, the Buddha say. And other uh, animal arts, he is uh, determining uh, lucky or unlucky gems or treasures, uh, staff, garments, swords, arrows, bows, and other weapons, whether a weapon will be a good weapon or not. Uh, same thing with women, men, boys, girls, male slaves, female slaves, elephants, ho- horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, foals, quails, lizards, rabbits, tortoises, and other animals, whether they are good or bad, or whether they are lucky or will bring luck or unluck, which is you can see in many cultures. Uh, if you buy this, uh, this and that animal, uh, this and that bird, an owl, or can be any any kind of animal actually, a snake, or or if you wear this talisman, uh, this tiger tooth around your neck, uh, then you have a, have better uh, good luck in life. And so he says, this is an animal art. And this is also an animal art of forecasting. The ruler will will march forth. The ruler will not march forth. Wars. The uh, the rulers will attack. Their ruler will attack. Uh, for example, uh, this is. Basically, if there is such a soothsayer, then he will imp- be employed by the armies uh, to do uh, to 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 forecast uh, the success of wars. Uh, animal arts also will be there will be a conjunction of the moon and asterism. The sun and moon will be favorable. The sun and moon will be unfavorable. Uh, there will be a meteor shower. There will be a horizon uh, w- filled with flickering light. There will come thunder. There will be dark clouds. There will be as the weather forecasting. There will be brightening of the sun and moon, uh, and so on. Lunar eclipse, riding a sickening and darkening of the sun. There will be disease, uh, there will be famine, there will be rest, there will be security. Any kind of prediction is animal and arts. There's also uh, calculating auspicious dates for marriages, both those who are in, in the, who are as the bride or, and who are uh, brought to the bride auspicious days for betrothal, auspicious days for divorce, collecting debts or making investments as a auspicious dates, lucky dates for these ones, which is actually commonly do, done here and routinely done here on Sri Lanka with no efficacy because there's many people who are uh, married on a very auspicious date and they are becoming divorced. Uh, so it wasn't apparently so not so auspicious that, uh, that, uh, that was, it was uh, giving. Uh, thought of. Another one is doing uh, doctoring, uh, as you also say, uh, practicing eye surgery or any kind is not allowed for a monk. So we can say unambiguously that uh, the Buddha speaks against any kind of uh, horoscope laying or talismans or charms or all this which we can under a broad sense call superstition, blind superstition. I hope this settle this issue. It has nothing to do with Buddhism. It's Buddha. He's unambiguously called all this mongo jumbo an animal art. So astrology, hopes, horoscopes, uh, talismans, uh, various predictions about lucky this and that animal art. Neither more, no less. I think actually this more or less should uh, cover uh, the seven questions for today. 
So I'm happy at heart. Uh, I hope this have been uh, have cleared up some issues uh, about uh, what the Buddha said and what he didn't say, and what is Buddhism and what is not Buddhism. Uh, please keep asking uh, for whatever uh, that you feel doubt about, and you cannot find it in the text or on my website. Then send forward the question, and I will take them every week. Thank you for your attention. Namo. Tasso. Bakavato. Aratto. Sama Sambutasa. Worthy. Indeed worthy. And perfectly self enlightened. Is a blessed book. Thank you. Have a nice day and Happy New Year.